Barbara Turner, and I'd like to share with you a little bit about sand play therapy from the Jungian School of Psychology. Sand play therapy was developed primarily for the use of children because they don't have the more abstract functioning and thinking skills that adults have, and um, it works with their natural language of play. We now, though, use sand play for both adults and children, and we'll learn more about that in a minute. Sand play consists of making a little world or design or whatever you like in this tray of sand. The, we have two trays in the office. One's, one is filled with wet sand, the other with dry. The wet sand can be sculpted and shaped, and the dry sand can't be sculpted and shaped in the same way, but it has a very elegant quality to it. So at one time, a client may feel like working in the dry tray. They may work one time in the wet. They may stay with one. Um, one is not better than the other. It's just a matter of preference. When I introduce sand play to a child, I usually say something like this. This is the sand tray, and every time you come into the office, you can always make a sand tray if you like. I may have some things to do for you to do some days. Some days you'll get to choose what we're going to do, but you can always do a sand play. The, uh, we have wet sand and dry sand. You can use either one. And what you do is just shape the sand, and you'll notice the tray is blue on the bottom. You can make a river or a design or an ocean or whatever you like. And then go to the shelves and you get to use any of the figures you want in the sand tray and make your own little world. And you'll know when you're done and you'll tell me. And while you're doing it, I just sit quietly across there and draw a little map of what you're doing. And you don't have to worry about me keeping up with you or whatever. I'm pretty good at it by now. And uh, that's what I say. Then I say, we just, when you're done, I come and look at it. And I may ask you if you had a story or a title for this one. And you could say yes and tell me. Or you can just say no. I, I don't know why I did it. It just, it just is. And that's fine. I just write that down. Then we take pictures of it. So when you're grown up, you can come back if you like. And we can look at them together. And by then, you'll be able to tell me what's going on in the sand play. Introducing sand play to adults is a little different. The reason for that is in most cultures, most uh, Western cultures today, everyone is so highly rationalized that we have long since forgotten about the symbolic dimensions of life. And in fact, we tend to uh, denigrate them or put them down, make fun of them. People feel silly when they do anything like a, a drawing or uh, you know, playing in the sand at the beach or sit, sitting on a swing and swinging back and forth. And it's very sad. But I, I have to be aware of that when I'm introducing to adults because most of them will initially think that this is rather silly, if not absolutely just for children. So I take an approach that uh, emphasizes how quickly this gets to deep work and moves us through. So they're thinking then, oh, I won't be in therapy as long, you know, and so on. So here's how I say it to an adult. This is uh, what we call the sand tray trays of sand, and the process is called sand play. And what you do is very simple. You come over and uh, you can shape the sand. You can use either the wet one or the dry one. And the uh, wet one you can sculpt a little more than the dry. You'll notice they're both blue on the bottom, so you can make a river, a design, or an ocean, or whatever you like. And while you're doing this, I sit across the room very quietly and just draw a little map of what you're doing. When you've touched the sand enough, or worked it enough, or just want to, you go to the shelves and just pick out whatever jumps out at you. You may have an idea what you want to do. You may not. It really doesn't matter. The psyche will do what it needs to do if we just let it. So um, that's about all there is to it. You'll, you may go back as many times as you want. You can change things as many times as you want. Move the sand, do whatever you need to. And don't worry about me, I can continue to draw my little map. It doesn't matter, I can keep up with them. And then you'll know when you're done. And you'll tell me, I'm done. So I'll come over and I'll look at it from the side from which you primarily worked. And I may ask you if you had any associations while you were doing this tray. And you may say, well, 
This guy's chasing that one, and this one looks like he's sick. Uh, that was scary. And I have no idea why I did the rest of this. And I write down, I just write that down, and that's it. Or you may say, I have no idea why I did this. Perfectly fine. So what's actually going on here is that Sam plays like a dream. However, the symbols that come out of the dream kind of drift away on their own. Here, they become three-dimensional. And in addition, they're shared with the therapist who's outside of our, our conscious realm and dimension. So what it's doing is, it's bringing up that deep material and it's putting it in place like stepping stones so we work through it very quickly. Would you like to do a sand play now? Let me demonstrate how an adult might do a sand tray, sand play. We tend to use the terms interchangeably, but technically the box is the tray, the method is the play. But you'll hear me use them both ways. So as the adult client, I'm going to come to the sand and I'm going to, I decided I'm going to work in the wet sand today, so we would probably move the dry sand away to give me room to walk around. And then I'm going to make a design or something, I don't know, just start moving the sand. Of course, I'm doing this in silence while the therapist is over there drawing a little map or something. And I don't really know what I'm doing, I'm just letting my hands lead the way. And if it feels right, I keep it. If it doesn't feel right, I keep moving and change it. the adult client does the sand play, I tell them this too, that they'll most likely feel very self-conscious to start with, but after a few trays they'll forget that I'm even in the room. And that's true, because what happens is we enter a very deep trance-like state. I also emphasize to the clients that this is not an art contest. No two sand plays have ever looked or felt the same, and it's not about making it look pretty. feels good to me, so I'm going to go to the shelves. And just for the purposes of the film and the demonstration, so we stay on camera, I'm just going to use the shelves behind me. And I'm just taking things. I don't know why. I've got an umbrella and a fiery dragon. There's a man reading a pan, top of a pan. This is a lotus and a silver chalice. White horses. A funny little dwarf.
There's some little trees, berry trees. It's kind of a red fiery bush. Here's Don Quixote defeated. And there's a star. It doesn't feel quite finished yet, so I'll put some, I think it needs some green things. It's a little star tree, so we move that one. Oh, and here's a big, chubby, laughing Buddha, watching the whole thing and laughing. And now I'm done. It just feels done. So then the therapist would come over and quietly look at it from the primary place that I worked the tray and maybe ask this client if she had any associations while she was doing it. And she might say something like, well, this is one of the funniest little things I've ever seen. And um, she's so wild looking, but I just loved her. And this is looks like a very defeated person over here leaving the scene. And this man banging on the pan looks like he's calling to the dragon. I don't know to get rid of him or to bring him here or what. But I like the umbrella on the dragon. It seems to protect him a bit. So maybe, maybe it's a, a good dragon. I don't know. And the Buddha watches the whole thing and laughs. Delight, delighted. And I don't know why I did the rest of this. I just don't know. And that's it. The therapist writes it down, and that's it. So then the therapist will take pictures for the record, and we never disassemble the tray in front of the client. We want the symbolic imagery to live in the client and to remain in place. I think it would be very destructive to take the tray apart in the, in the presence of the client. So we don't do that in the Jungian uh, method of sand play. The theory behind sand play stems from the work of Carl Gustav Jung. Uh, he happened to be the neighbor of Mrs. Dora Kolf, who invented the sand play method. As it worked out, Mrs. Kolf was a, uh, a concert pianist, and she had lost a husband in the wars and was living up in the uh, in Switzerland uh, next door to the Jungs. And uh, the story goes that Carl Jung's children always seemed to be very centered and at peace when they returned home from the Kolf's house. So when uh, Dora was doing analysis with Emma Jung, and she consulted with Carl Jung about what she might do for work, because um, 
concert pianist wasn't going to do it for her. He suggested that she was very good with children. Why doesn't she find a way to work with children in Jungian analysis? So she began her studies and pursuits, and she came across Dr. Mar Margaret Lowenfeld from London. And Lowenfeld developed what we call the world technique, which consists of the children taking toys and figures from baskets and selecting through them and making a world. And then Mrs. Dr. Lowenfeld will talk uh, uh, with the child in a very respectful way about their world. Um, and um, Dorkhoff went to study with her. Originally, uh, Margaret Lohenfeld was from Poland. So after a devastating war in Poland, she returned. Uh, she's a pediatrician in the early 20th century. She returned to find that the children were so traumatized and um, she was horrified. And she set about to find a way she could directly access the way they're thinking. And in her pursuits, she remembered a book written by H.G. Wells, the social uh, theorist in London, and it's called Floor Games. It's a tiny little book, and um, my sister and I have brought it back into print if you'd like to have a copy of it. It's, uh, it is delightful. H.G. Wells talks about, uh, in a very humorous and loving way, about the games his children, his two boys, played on their nursery floor and that these games consisted simply and primarily of wooden blocks and pieces of paper and leaves that they would find in the garden and so on, and a few purchased toys uh, of figures of people and animals and so on, and that they had magnificent times with these floor games. Well, Dr. Lohenfeld remembered this and she thought, I'm going to get a big box of figures for the clinic in London. So she got a big box of figures and she set it in the clinic in London and it was the children themselves that came up with the world technique. The kids would take the figures from this side of the clinic, which was large, and carry them all the way over to the opposite side of the clinic where the sandbox was and they would make worlds in the sandbox. So that's how Mrs. Uh, Dr. Lowenfeld came up with the world technique. When Dora Kolf studied with Dr. Lowenfeld, she saw something happening in the sand worlds of the children that were exactly what Jung described in the individuation process. Furthermore, she saw the process of coming to center, coming to wholeness, that she knew well from her studies in Tibetan Buddhism. She had frequently hosted Tibetan Buddhist monks at her home and uh, even had a visit from the Dalai Lama at one time. In fact, in my, sand, in my sand trays, I even have a little tiny bit of sand um, that was blessed by the Dalai Lama from Dorokov's sand tray. So it makes it a very special thing. So Dr. Lowenfeld and Mrs. Kolf talked about these differences, and uh, Mrs. Kolf was very wary of Inter interfering with the child by talking with them about what was going on because she saw, she was highly intuitive and very intelligent, she saw that this was largely unconscious. So she thought it best to just stay silent and stay out of the way, don't, don't interpret the worlds. So uh, Lowenfeld and Kolf talked about this and they agreed to have two different methods. Lowenfeld's would continue to be called the world technique and Mrs. Kolf called hers sand play. She thought it was critical that the word play be in there because we access that uh, dimension, that play frame, when we go and work directly with the symbols. So that's how it came to be. And Mrs. Kolf began using it in her office in Switzerland with the children. And soon the parents of these children were just amazed at how quickly and how well their children were doing. So they, did, they wanted to try sand play themselves. So, we now work with sand play with both adults and kids. To better illustrate the sand play process, let's take a look at a couple of sand play case vignettes. Let's first take a look at the case of a young boy, Aaron, age 9, brought to therapy by his mother for anger issues. When we first look at Aaron's tray, 
we see that it has a sense of ordered, an ordered quality about it. We have Asian men in the front near uh, left corner looking into a crystal ball, three Asian ninjas in the front center preparing to fight. There's a uh, group of cartoon characters on the right, Batman, Robin, and the enemies engaged in conflict, a pair of skiers coming down the hill directly behind them, and a lion tamer holding his hand high to a tiger in the back left corner. In the center, raised high on a hill, is a man encased in armor, huge in proportion to the other figures in the tray. When we look at a first sand play in a series, or a sand play process as we call it, we look for a symbolic um, manifestation of both the intrapsychic conflict that this process will address and the assets, the psychic assets that the client has to ad address that material. Here in Aaron's first tray we see pictures of anger and conflict, a speeding car being chased by a policeman attempting to bring order to it. We have in the back a raging huge tiger uh, and a, a man holding up his hand as if to try to tame it and calm it down. In the middle we have a man who is completely encased in steel. He can't move, he can't breathe, he is not connected with life. We have here in the front left a picture of wisdom and insight with the two Asian men glancing into the crystal ball. On the other end of the diagonal from the wise man, we see a pair of skiers very skillfully descending a hill. Now, if we look at both diagonals, we've got, and the diagonal in a sand play is the farthest distance you can get uh, between two clusters of figures or symbols. We have on one hand the roaring, raging tiger lion and the tamer. On the other end, we have Batman and Robin trying to bring order and reason to the crooks. Crossing that, we have the skiers, very skilled, and then the wisdom of the Asian men looking into the future. At the cruxus, at where these two diagonals cross, is this man encased in steel. So it would appear that in order to bring order and justice to tame the out-of-control anger, it's going to access Aaron's inner wisdom and skill, and that will then release the man in the steel suit. So something needs to be released inside of Aaron, psyche that has not been able to emerge yet. As Aaron moves into his fourth tray, he touches the center of the personality, the self. We call this the manifestation of the self. We saw in his first tray that he had that the psyche outlined the direction of its healing to release something that's been locked up, encased in him, and perhaps causing this rage and his anger problems on a very deep level. And he will use then the assets that he has, wisdom, from a remote part of his consciousness, and skill to con confront these issues. In trays two and three, he confronts many issues. And in tray four, then, he moves to the center of the self. So the psyche acknowledges the centrality of the self. In this tray, we have a central fire surrounded by a ring of seated Native Americans. They're both men and women at the circle. Some of the women have children. Surrounding this inner circle are two quaternities, a square of trees, of four trees, and then a square of four religious masks from two traditions, the Hindu and the Navajo people. The, uh, both are very remote from the consciousness of this young Jewish boy. 
It's very interesting that the masks from the Hindu tradition come from the well-loved story of the Ramayana, where Lord Rama, and we see his green face in the far right corner, and seated across from him is his beloved wife Sita. Her face is turned away from us here in the picture. Rama adored Sita, and Sita was born out of a furrow in the earth. So she is the very essence, the quintessence of the feminine. And Rama is the quintessence of the masculine. Well, what happens then is this demon, who we see with the little sort of butterfly wings and the hint of yellow around over here by the serpent, he steals Sita away. And the tale has to do with Rama recovering Sita and getting back and honoring the feminine as the center part of his life. Above the tray, on the far edge, is a little girl, little Native American girl, that Aaron described as the spirit of a princess who died a long, long time ago. She stands by a moon, and he said they are actually hanging over the fire. So here, Aaron's psyche accesses the collective unconscious to bring about the precise myth that he will need to release those feminine energies and his spiritual energies from that encased man in tray one. This is Aaron's final tray, tray 15. I saw him for about 30 sessions over a year and a half, and he averaged one tray every other session. In this tray, you'll notice that he's divided the world in half with this arcing river, and on the right side sits a woman on a park bench in the far right corner. He later said that's his mother. On the left side, we see uh, a statue in the front left, a gold statue. Aaron said, this is the statue of a guy who fought. What Aaron's done here is return many of the uh, uh, bad guys or uh, adversaries that he fought in his previous trays. If we take a look behind the three-headed dragon, we'll see the penguin that we met in tray one. The other figures came along in his other trays. You notice that both halves of the world are connected with a bridge and that a little blue car leaves the side of the conflict towards the home side or the uh, peaceful world side. Along the river hanging over the tray on a hook, uh, Aaron constructed a way to hang the rocket man figure who patrols the river, so this is a very safe place. We have the car leaving the side of the conflict, returning to the normal wor world. And on the left side, we have a dark train leaving or exiting the scene as well. In a final tray, we do what Mrs. Kolf called return to the marketplace. The psyche returns to the ordinary world. Here Aaron moves out of the arena of conflict and returns to the feminine, the woman in the corner. Here we see a very fit and tiny boxer next to what in proportion is a gigantic victory cup of silver. So what we, ha we see here in Aaron's final tray is a man next to some silver metal. It reflects the silver metal encasement of the knight in tray one. But here what's happened is it's transformed into a victory cup and the man is no longer encased in it. His spirit has been released and he is returning to normal life. When he was 15 years old, Aaron and his mother returned to my office for a session to review Aaron's sand play case. At that time he was able to tell us what was going on within him in each tray. It was a very moving experience. It worked out that Aaron was 
doing very well in school. He was quite popular with the girls. He was on the football team. And not surprising from the content of his sand play case, he was a deeply spiritual and religious boy. It was an honor to have worked with Aaron and to follow up and to hear of his success. At this point, we're going to look at a different case vignette, that of an older man whom I'm calling Harold. He was in his 60s. He entered therapy because his wife told him to. She complained that he had violent, angry outbursts. This was his third marriage. He had several children of all variety of ages. He was a professional, and he entered that profession because his first wife told him to. His mother was still living, his father was unknown, and he complained that his mother tried to control him. Harold didn't want to do sand play. He did sand play because I told him to. As you can tell from his biography, his history has to do with being powerless around women, his mother in particular, still being alive in her 90s and still telling him what to do. So I brought that into the room by directing him to do a sand play. He often said he didn't want to be in therapy, but knowing his history with women telling him what to do, I did not let him off the hook. I was going to wait for him to come forward and say, I am going to stop therapy. As we first sit with Harold's tray, we may have a feeling of de depression, sadness, a sense of hopelessness, lifelessness. The landscape itself is barren, and there isn't a great deal of life in it. We have a dead cow skull from a cow that had died long time ago, a lizard in a very tiny little pond. What water is present is rather sketchy and ill-defined. There is more life in the back left corner where we have this voluptuous young woman, the colorful house, and the little green tree. Across from her is this very old, sick man. It's actually a statue of Lazarus, directly after he was raised from the dead. We can see that he's very skinny. He's got uh, wounds all over his body, raw sores. He's on crutches. And from the looks of him, I doubt that he's going to be able to make this journey across the bridge. In addition, there's a boa constrictor next to him, and given his uh, appearance of weakness, I think he is very much under threat of being strangled. Harold had always identified himself as a ladies' man. He was debonair, sophisticated, good-looking. He didn't have a father, so he said he modeled himself after Cary Grant in the movies and he charmed ladies his entire life. But now he's old, and he's confronting, it appears, his mortality as this very wounded man, just raised from the grave, looks at this voluptuous young woman across the tray. In the center of the tray, we have a tall mountain peak surrounded by three flying white birds. The bird is frequently a symbol of the spirit because it ascends to the heavens and then returns to the earth. Perhaps something of the spirit will help Harold accept himself as he is. While he's always envisioned himself as a ladies' man, he's actually powerless around women. Harold has always carried a false persona. He's been acting his whole life. He's been Cary Grant. Well, in his first tray here, the psyche poses this conflict and this false identity in stark, ungetoverable terms. And yet, central is this beautiful mountain peak with three birds, three being a dynamic number, something on the move. From this first tray, it appears then that Harold's healing or transformational direction in his sand play process will be to surrender this false identity and to access deeper resources that are aligned with the self. Harold is much more grounded 
and focused by tray five. The tray's much more full of life. It feels a lot more real, in a sense, than tray one. To track the process the psyche moves through during sand play work, we look at what remains the same from tray to tray and what changes. What remains the same here in this tray is that we have an old man and we have a woman. Here she's the Venus de Milo. What has changed is that the man is a real old man. It's no longer a wounded, bleeding Lazarus, but it's a real old man seated appropriately in his garden on a bench. Directly in front of him, he sees that this woman is not a woman. It's an archetypal form. She's not real. It's very clear now. The table is set for a banquet. His psyche is feeding itself. It has food now to move on. Outside of the circle is an empty cage. Perhaps he's out of the cage now as he's moved more appropriately into his own central garden. His home is much bigger and we have the impression here it's definitely his home. On the right he's erected a tower with a golden egg on top of a Mayan figure of a corn god. After the tray was over, he said that this reminded him of the sign at the shopping center, which is kind of sad because that's how he always entertained himself, was by buying things. But now we see that it's outside the circle. It's not inside the circle with this old man. Perhaps the only power that Harold felt he had was purchasing things. But now he's fleshed out. He's a real man, and he no longer needs this tower. In Harold's final tray, tray 8, a caravan of elephants is celebrated as and welcomed home by a cheerleader. The mountain from Tray 1 returns its center front, and the Venus de Milo returns, now erected as a statue in the center of the village. The home is present, and a little devil figure lurks behind the house. In the upper right-hand corner, a very funny old man has taken a superwoman figure to a bedroom and set out cocktails and Harold just laughed and said that's an impossible situation. As the homecoming is celebrated here the psyche portrays uh, an image of this man that's funny it's a, it's a silly figure. There's a sense of humor injected into the situation, looking at how he had identified himself before in very humorous terms. Perhaps this sense of humor that he has about his situation is that little devil that lurks behind the house, sort of the knowing little devil. By this time, Harold was exhibiting much more personal strength in his relationship with his wife and with his mother. He actually told his mother no on a few occasions and he was much more uh, clear with his wife about what his needs and feelings were. He d his bouts of anger and outbursts had remarkably decreased. And by this time then Harold was able to tell me that he was ready to leave therapy and I agreed with him yes indeed you are. Harold did not live too many years after I finished working with him, but how wonderful it was that he was able to resolve these issues psychically before he met his death. When we're doing sand play with adults, we generally have a parallel process going on with um, verbal therapy. The verbal therapy being far more conscious, and mostly conscious, rational, and so on, 
while the sand play aspect of the therapy is uh, mostly unconscious at that point and uh, is way in advance of the consciousness that the client's uh, currently working at. So what happens is the, the work from the sand trays is like images from a dream. It comes up and makes almost like stepping stones, I've said, to uh, help us follow our path to healing and to wholeness. But it trails along in consciousness. So that will emerge in consciousness. What's happening in the sand play will emerge in consciousness later on down the line. So the sand play process may be advanced like this, and the verbal process trails behind like that. The theory used to support the sand play process is the personality theory of Carl Gustav Jung. And for those of you that aren't familiar with his personality theory, just very simply, uh, Jung believed and saw that if given the uh, appropriate circumstances, the human psyche had uh, a natural tendency and was in fact compelled to heal and to grow or further develop, to become more of who it is, to become more of the self, to integrate more of the self. Jung also saw, early in his work with his patients, two levels of thinking going on at the same time. He saw the ordinary thinking, the conscious, uh, verbal, uh, more uh, communication, uh, talking level of um, consciousness. And then he saw this other unconscious, non-conscious level of thinking, uh, whose language was symbols and, um, and uh, mythologies, the stories those symbols tell. This is how he developed his theory of the conscious and unconscious minds. Well, the sand play allows us to directly access the unconscious mind. So when the person is working in the sand tray, child or adult, they're actually work, moving the psyche. The psyche is actually moving as these symbols uh, and figures come together and form symbolic statements or uh, imagery. The psyche is actually moving. So as this moves, it comes from the shelf and comes here, the psyche is actually moving that needed element to that position and in this relationship with these other figures. So when we look at a sand tray or a sand play, we're not looking at an artifact of the psyche. We're looking at what was actually going on in that psyche at that moment. It's, it's uncanny, but we have to really get that while we're working in sand play, we directly access the unconscious. And given that natural tendency to heal and develop, the psyche moves where it needs to. It brings up conflicts that, that are in our way. We address them, we move through them, we access new materials, and we transform and become more whole. Recent research in neurobiology uh, tells us that the real healing that goes on in therapy, uh, in spite of what modality we use, it really happens in a, um, a less conscious level of brain functioning. In fact, what they're finding out is that real healing and growth in the psyche or the brain takes place in the right hemispheric functions and often the limbic uh, functions. So what we're doing in healing is very, really unconscious. And that's the level we access with the, um, with the sand play therapy. So the verbal therapy is quite conscious. The sand play therapy is largely unconscious. The verbal therapy often has a hierarchical relationship between the therapist and the client. The client often regards the therapist as a, uh, an authority or of someone better, bigger, or whatever. And the uh, sand play, on the other hand, is um, it's a mutual witnessing of what goes on. The witnessing itself is very important because it's much like learning and, and learning theory. When something is seen, when I tell you something that I've been thinking or suspecting or feeling, and you, you get it, you understand it, then it, it becomes cemented in reality. It becomes real for me. Sand plays operating at the same, in the same way. It, the symbolic construction emerges and is fixed in a three-dimensional place, and the witness therapist sees it 
and then thereby validates it. If we draw from quantum theory, we might say that the external witnessing consciousness of the therapist, and I say external because it's outside of the client's psychic construct, the external consciousness of the witness actually helps what the quantum theorists call collapse, the non-manifest into reality. So this witness helps make this real by witnessing and honoring it. Now the therapist need not understand everything that's happening in the client's sand play. I asked Mrs. Golf this question at one point and she said this, it was so poignant, I actually remembered it. She said, you need not be engaged in understanding everything in the sand play, but you must remain engaged in coming to understand what is transpiring in the sand play. So we remain engaged by learning and studying the symbols, studying personality theory, how these symbols are carrying how, uh, the psyche, moving the psyche, what theory, how we would apply theory to these. We remain engaged in that way. In fact, it was years and years and years into my work in sand play before I could look at a sand tray and have any concept at all of what was going on. But it kept working because I honored it and respected it very profoundly. It worked for the clients as well as in my own process, of course. Well, Dora Kolf coined what she called the free and protected space of sand play. These are the conditions Jung said the psyche needs to grow towards the self, to exercise that natural tendency, that, that compelling uh, urge to grow and develop and heal. The free and protected space is free because you have available to you by combinations, by making things, anything you need. All parts of life and fantasy are represented in the collection. And we also have a number of building materials in case you need something that isn't there. We've got paper, string, scissors, you know, glue, uh, tape, uh, wood blocks, tiles, any kind of thing a person might need to make something they can't seem to find in the collection. And the collection, by the way, I know I'm going off on a bit of a tangent here, but the collection need not be as, um, as extensive as mine. A small collection, as long as it's got a wide range of figures, uh, is quite adequate and works just as well. The psyche will find and do what it needs to do. I have an excellent list of the figures to have in a beginning collection in my handbook of sand play therapy, if you'd like to refer to that. So we'll go back to the free and protected space. It is completely free because you are told by the therapist you can do whatever you need to do. And if we stop and think about it, that is an awe-inspiring direction because an opportunity. Where in life do we have the freedom to do whatever we need to do? Where do we give us that space, ourselves that space to do it? Well, in sand play, that's what you do. I always tell the children, you can do anything you want, but you can't throw sand at Dr. Barb. And they laugh. <laughs> Sometimes they say that to the, to the adults. I'll tell them, you can do whatever you want. But I always tell the kids, you can't throw sand at me. They get a kick out of it. But they get the idea. You can do anything you want. And, um, and so they do. Now, the other aspect of the free and protected space is the protection. It's very safe. It's safe in a number of ways. The construction of the tray itself is safe because it has delimited boundaries. The size and shape of the tray is such that it fills the field of, of vision without having the client needing to turn the head or extend the body. It just fills the field of vision. So that's why it, it um, really compels us to a deeper place. The size of the tray is also in the handbook. Another and very critical safety feature of sand play is the presence of the well-trained and experienced certified sand play therapist. Um, it takes years uh, to understand what's going on here and to know, to recognize the signs when someone is 
uh, heading into unsafe territory. It's very easy to evoke a psychotic process with sand play for the unknowing therapist. I've seen it. It's very dangerous, and I'm, my and my opinion is highly unethical to the client. I tell my students that of all of these wonderful toys from all over the world, all of these building materials, these trays of sand and so on, the most important tool in the sand play room is the therapist, the quality of their presence, because that is what makes this very safe. And if that presence isn't there, the sand play will stop or it will go into a very dark direction. So that's why thorough training is needed. So let's talk a minute about what's needed to train in sand play therapy. If you happen to live, live in a region that has a branch of the International Society for Sand Play Therapy, um, ISST, we call that, you will follow their training guidelines. If you are not in a region that has an ISST branch, I suggest that you follow, particularly if you train with me, we follow the Sand Play Therapists of America uh, training guidelines for one of two um, credentials. And the first is the Sand Play Practitioner. This is where we start. The, sand, the Certified Sand Play Therapist is the second credential, and that takes far more experience and time. Let's talk a minute about the Sand Play Practitioner. To, do the, to become a sand play practitioner, first you must be licensed as a mental health professional. Because we are dealing with the depths of the psyche, this is not a tool for teachers or for um, kindergarten teachers or anything like that, it, or daycare people. This is a tool for the trained psychologist or psychotherapist. So to train in, psycho, uh, in um, sand play therapy with me, I always say you must either be licensed or you must be on a licensing track. In other words, if you are in graduate school working toward licensing and you want to study sand play, fine with me, but you can't practice and you can't get your practitioner certification until you're licensed. Secondly, we work on the level, two levels in training. One is the rational cognitive level, that's the, the learning and knowledge aspect of things. And uh, the, an important level is the precognitive, non-rational, symbolic level. And this is where you do your own sand play process with a certified sand play practitioner. Oh, no, certified play, sand play uh, therapist, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, and a process can be anywhere from 15 to 35 trays. It can actually even be less than that. It could be far more than that. Uh, it just depends on what piece of work the psyche undertakes in that particular process. So you do your own process, and then the studying requires a minimum of 36 hours of training with a certified sand play therapist, and 18 of those hours must be a course entitled Introduction to Sand Play Therapy. You must also then be in consultation with a certified sand play therapist. And this is when you start practicing therapy in your, your clinic or school or practice. And um, you're working towards your, your practitioner status. You work under consultation with the certified sand play therapist. And with the advantages of Skype these days, it is no longer uh, very difficult to get face-to-face -face consultation with the therapist because we can do it uh, through Skype. So that's wonderful. Uh, this requires there are certain numbers you have to fulfill uh, and you can check these numbers online. We'll have resources for you at the end of the tape. But I believe we get, uh, you can have uh, 20 hours or 25 hours or 25 sessions rather of a group consultation. And a consultation group has a maximum of six people. And during those 25 sessions, you must have uh, presented your case material from your practice at least five times. So you're practicing, and uh, you must have about three people doing sand play or three sand trays a week on a fairly regular basis to give you enough uh, material to get some experience. And you may take um, digital photos of these, and you bring them to consultation, and your group, and you, with your therapist, the uh, sand play, certified sand play therapist, and you 
uh, review the material and learn from your own material and support your own work with your real clients. You can do individual consultation, uh, 15 hours of individual consultation uh, is the minimum requirement. A combination of group and individual I believe is 20 hours and you must present at least, I think, four times during those 20 hours, combination group sessions and individual. Well, we're coming to a conclusion here, and I heartily, heartily encourage you to join our training, Introduction to Sand Play Therapy, and perhaps some advanced trainings as well. Even if you don't plan to practice sand play therapy, I think it's a, a very wise and it's a wonderful experience to get inside sand play, so to speak, and understand what it is. So you know what people are talking about when they, then when they tell you that they are a sand play therapist. Or you know when uh, a child or an adult could really benefit by referral to a sand play therapist. I thank you for listening today and joining me in my office. It's an honor to have you here, and I hope to meet many of you in our upcoming trainings. I've been practicing sand play therapy now for over 20 years, and I must tell you, very sincerely, I never ever tire of it. No two sand trays are ever the same. No two sand plays ever feel the same. Even if I lose a picture somehow and have to reconstruct a tray for a record, it never ever feels like the real thing. It cannot be replicated. Sand play constantly keeps me on the edge of my chair, so to speak, the cutting edge of myself, having to learn more about my own inner workings and deal with more and more of my issues as I learn more and more about symbols and myth. I have found sand play to be highly effective in a wide variety of clinical presentations, anything from depression to repression, anxiety, um, oh, just down the list, down the list, relationship issues, anything, anything, lots of trauma work. I've done a lot of trauma work in sand play. It's very effective for healing. Well, bye for now, and I hope to see you at the upcoming training.